Good day, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to discuss with you two different techniques in terms of spectroscopy and elucidating structures. So first off, I'm going to go uh, over um, IR or infrared spectroscopy. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go over the basics with you. Then I'm going to get into stretches versus bends, so different ranges within um, the entire infrared spectrum. Okay, and then uh, ranges and distinct stretches and band, bends about each particular type of um, functional group. Excuse me. And then um, more theory, just really Hooke's Law and then uh, hydrogen bonding effects and how that affects stretching and bending, what have you. And then interpreting spectra and then some examples. Then kind of switching gears to CNMR, which is going to be uh, even more powerful in terms of what um, that information will tell you about a particular structure or analyte. So we're going to look again at ranges, um, you know, from 250 to 14 ppm. Then examples of deshielding and shielding. Uh, counting the carbon signals, whether they be primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. This is all going to be aided by DEP90 and 135 experiments, which really help out. And then finally, uh, C13 and hydrogen uh, NMR data samples that were, or sorry, examples that we're going to compare kind of side by side and then um, see if we can look at or expect different type of spectra. Okay, based on um, what the compound is. All right, so uh, leading into infrared spectroscopy. So again, um, infrared deals with vibrational energy. So uh, falling down from, you know, N equals seven. So N being the principal quantum number down to, let's say five. So there's gonna be a drop in, uh, which is what is referred to as the passion series. That is P-A-S-C-H-E-N, just for your own edification. Um, so that's going to be between 4,000 centimeters inverse and 400 centimeters inverse. So that inverse means that these are wave numbers. These are not wavelengths. Okay. So the higher the wave number, the higher the energy. So in other words, you see that inverse there. So remember, if you're thinking of wavelengths, Remember, the lower the wavelength, the higher the energy, sort of like you think of UV, which is going to be about 200 nanometers, as opposed to, let's say, visible light, which is going to be 500 nanometers. 200 nanometers is more likely to fry your eyeballs than 500, in which you process all the time. Okay, so <clears throat> how, um, how much is that vibrational energy uh, absorbed? Well, it's really the inverse of that and how much is transmitted across the whole spectrum. So, or at particular frequencies. So at 100% is where the baseline is. That means 100% transmittance. All of those infrared um, photons are just passing through this, the uh, sample and the matrix that the sample is in. So that means 100% of IR photons undergo transmission through a sample at a given wave number. Okay, so again, this is going to be wave number or frequency, which is this sort of curve V that you see here, um, <clears throat> specific. Okay, so the lower the transmittance, the stronger the signal at a given wave number. So approaching 0%, that means it's most absorbing, right? So uh, pretty much absorbing at a maximum. So again, transmittance and absorbance are going to be inversely proportional. So that means where no light is transmitted at that particular frequency. It's all taken up by whatever functionality um, is going to be stretched or bent or whatever. Okay, so uh, speaking of stretches versus bends, so stretches appear between 4,000 and 1,000 um, wave numbers. So again, centimeters inverse is just another um, way of saying wave numbers. Bending appears between 1,000 and 400 centimeters. So kind of most to the right is where you're gonna see the bending. Now, when you're talking about bending, you're talking out of plane bending or in plane bending. So uh, we're really thinking about alkenes and aromatic compounds that are already 
planar, right, in terms of structure or flat. Okay, um, now stretches most distinct uh, are really the most distinctive data in determining functionality. So um, we're really going to look at OH uh, stretches, triple bonds, double bonds, and the like. Okay, so the bands say more about CC double bonds, especially aromatics. Or sorry, the bends do. Uh, this is going to be bends, B E N D S, like getting the bends. Okay, so let's uh, let's kind of broadly discuss some of the ranges here. So the frequency range between four thousand and twenty five hundred centimeters. It's going to cover the OH, CH, and NH stretches. Okay, so uh, 4,000 to 2,500, that means it's going to be highest in energy. The reason why it's so high in energy is because if you think about it, oxygen 16 Daltons or uh, grams per mole in terms of atomic weight, as opposed to hydrogen, which is just one gram per mole. Okay, same thing for C to H. So there's, again, a great disparity in terms of... Um, atomic weights between the two and then 14 to 1 so again these are going to be highest in terms of energy and also you can think of those bonds being longer right so in other words they're going to stretch out a little bit more and have a little bit of more uh, room to kind of bounce around so you can think of uh, let's say you know a tennis ball connected to a, a, a spring with a bowling ball right so a bowling ball is way uh, heavier in comparison to a tennis ball and uh, that energy is going to basically kind of be disproportionate just because there's so much of a difference in um, you know the masses between the two that are connected to this spring okay so when we get into Hooke's law this will kind of make more sense when we start talking about uh, how the mass kind of changes the frequency. Okay, so 25 to 2,000 wave numbers. Uh, you see here that those are going to be distinctive uh, triple bonds, so C triple bond N, which really isn't going to have much of a range. It's really going to fall at one distinct um, frequency or, or close to it. And then uh, C triple bond C, or in other words, alkyne, Depending on whether that's going to be a terminal alkyne or whether that's going to be, you know, somewhere situated in the middle of a linear construct, that is going to uh, change which frequency it shows up within that range. Okay, uh, now 2000 to 1500, we're uh, going to be looking at CO double bonds, CN double bonds, and CC double bonds. I put them in the, that particular order. Because again, if you have some disparity between those two nuclei and their atomic weights, the higher the energy it's going to be. So it's going from higher to lower energy. All right, fifteen hundred to a thousand is just going to be covering the single C C bonds, um, OO bonds, NN bonds. So all of those those aren't in any particular order in terms of energy, but uh, that does give you an idea of what kind of uh, stretching is going on between single, uh, singly bound nuclei that are identical. So in other words, homo uh, nucle you know, nucleus um, pairings there. So this is heteronucleus, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's why they're so much lower. In fact, to the, you know, to at least a thousand, uh, if not more wave numbers in, in difference. Okay, so then once again, less than a thousand, we're going to be looking at bending and wagging. Okay, so where hydrogens kind of wiggle about. All right. Um, okay, so H bonding or hydrogen bonding, um, again, that's an intermolecular interaction, will broaden stretches for OH and NH. That's because remember that these lone pairs are going to kind of tag along with this H. Uh, either acting as an acceptor, in this case acting as a donor, right? So in other words, it's kind of in a struggle for where that hydrogen is going to be. So if you compare, let's say, an alcohol OH stretch to a carboxylic acid OH stretch, it's going to be a little bit different. Okay, so 
If you look at problem 15.21 on page uh, 746, just for copyright reasons, I'm not going to put the um, spectra up there. That's why you have your text. So take a look at that. Um, pause a minute and then see what you have uh, in terms of a comparison with this carboxylic acid um, OH group and then this OH group that's going to be right here adjacent to a ketone. Okay, so... <clears throat> Uh, now, notice that with the carboxylic acid OH stretches, they overlap with the CH stretches around 3,000. Now, just uh, as, a, as a sort of preamble to uh, what we're going to be looking at structurally, CH stretches don't really tell you very much, right? We're dealing with organic chemistry, so alkanes and alkenes and... Uh, that's kind of commonplace in terms of organic chemistry and, and what analytes you're going to be looking at. So it doesn't really tell you much. Really, the electronegative groups are going to tell you more, uh, give you more information. Okay, so um, versus the alcoholic OH stretches are going to be higher in energy. So they're going to be somewhere around 34, 3600 wave numbers. Okay, so, um, so this is going to kind of overlap with 3,000. This is going to be at 3,400. So why is there such a difference? Well, if you think about it, um, this is going to be much easier to what is referred to as dimerize. So if you have a hydrogen right here that can uh, act as a donor from, again, an identical molecule on this side, this is what's referred to as dimerization. That doesn't mean they're actually forming bonds, but you can actually um, sort of predict some sort of six-membered or greater ring between you know these two compounds. So this is going to be a very stable structure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there's two uh, intermolecular hydrogen bonds that can be established. So it's uh, very very much lower energy than what you're going to see right here. You're still going to see a broad sort of sweep of a stretch in terms of a signal. But um, again, this is going to be lower in energy. This is going to show up um, a little bit higher because again, you know, this <clears throat> isn't going to dimerize as well because you have two carbons in between these two oxygen species as opposed to just one on the left. Okay, so now we're going to think about amines and uh, their NH stretching. So uh, only notice that primary and secondary amines. So if you have a tertiary amine, that means there are no hydrogens attached to nitrogen. Thus, you won't see anything in this higher range, somewhere around 32, 3300 uh, wave numbers. Okay, um, <clears throat> so again, primary, secondary amines. Um, asymmetric stretching, is you're going to see that for amides. So remember, the amides are going to look something like this. Get a dull pen to use here. Something a little bit more pronounced. Ah, now we're cooking with gas. Okay. So uh, remember that you're going to have that lone pair right there about the nitrogen. That's basically going to fix or situate these hydrogens, you know, uh, outside of the plane of the ring, inside of the plane of the ring, what have you. Right, so uh, you're going to have some overlapping signals for the primary ones only. Secondary, you're just going to have one single sort of uh, stretch, and that's really it. Okay, so again, CH stretches don't tell us really anything. They're ubiquitous in all organic compounds, so um, you know it's just not much to learn from that whole region around 3,000. Okay, so CO double bond stretches are very distinctive in terms of where their frequencies show up. There's just kind of a really narrow window in terms of where one species is going to be, um, you know, relative to another. So esters that are going to be highest, followed by aldehydes, followed by ketones, followed by carboxylic acids, and amides. So you can kind of think of higher to lower energy so these are going to be more resonance stabilized right esters have a little bit of resonance stability but remember they have um if you were to do a resonance structure with an ester <clears throat> you 
you'd have some kind of charge separation. Right. And that, let's say, uh, methyl group or whatever there is that is on the other side of the ester is going to kind of stabilize that positive charge a little bit, but this is going to be electronegative. So it's a uh, little bit less of an effect than you see with carboxylic acid and amides. Okay. So aldehydes are going to be higher energy, ketones are going to be higher energy, and you know, just south of uh, 1700 you're going to see carboxylic acids and amides. Okay, so uh, conjugation lowers the CO stretch further. Why is that? Because remember, if you have a conjugated system of pi bonds, um, that's going to shrink. First of all, it's going to shrink the, the length of those bonds, CO double bond, the CC double bond, and uh, you're going to have a more elaborate pi network or pi system. Okay, so if you think about it this way, Think about this. So instead of uh, this showing up around, you know, 1710 or something like how it would for a typical ketone, this would actually be a little bit lower. It'd be about 1670. Okay. All right. Um, now, same for uh, alkenes versus aromatic CC stretches. So alkenes are going to be weak signals, again, because there's no elaborate pi system nothing else to conjugate it. Uh, maybe a little bit of a different story if you have a conjugated um, linear system. But something that's aromatic, you're constantly going to have those uh, pi bonds kind of circling about. So this is something you want to pay attention to for next semester if you continue on with this course. Uh, so stronger but lower uh, frequency, okay? So in other words, more stable. Okay, so CCC triple bond, or sorry, CC triple bond versus CN triple bond. Again, alkyne groups have a range of frequencies, and uh, really not so much for CN because these are always going to be terminal. You're going to have that lone pair there, right? Um, okay, so how about a bending? So bending is really more a confirmation of uh, the other functionality here. So the alkenes and aromatics that I previously mentioned here, this is going to show up between 1500 and, uh, sorry, a little above 1500. Okay. Um, so aromatic, you're going to see, you know, more than one signal, possibly, uh, especially if you see that something's disubstituted. We'll see some uh, evidence of that later. Is if there's some kind of asymmetric stretching. Okay, so symmetric stretching, you're going to see everything under sort of one particular peak, but asymmetric stretching, you're going to see more than one um, stretch or frequency that's kind of overlapping. All right, so let's go back to Hooke's Law real quick. Um, oh, if you want to take a look at some of the data on table 15-3 on page 756, that should give you a good um, kind of estimation of what kind of bends and wags you'll see, um, you know, uh, just south of a thousand wave numbers. Okay, so Hooke's Law, this K value that you see right here, if any of you have taken mechanics and physics, um, so K is just going to be the actual spring constant or how stiff or loose that particular spring is. And then uh, the mass, of course, is whatever um, is attached to that spring, right? And then, of course, the frequency is how uh, how regular or how in frequent or infrequent that um, that spring kind of goes back and forth from its maximum all the way to its starting point where it's next to, or nearest uh, its origin. Okay, so uh, some examples to attempt uh, without you know um, looking into solutions manual if you have it or what have you, take a look at these examples and um, we'll go over them together. Um, so 15.41, uh, examples A, B, D, E, and I. So this is just like sort of a before and after comparison, what kind of stretches you may see. Uh, so I would take about 10, 15 minutes at least to kind of work with that. And these next few um, examples, you might want to take some time. 
Okay, so um, I'll just kind of go over a couple of those. Just kind of give you a brief uh, intro to what each of those problems is going to entail. So 15.41, uh, that's going to be predicting important stretches of reactants to products. So comparing sort of before and afters of a reaction. Okay, 15.59 is going to be predicting the right isomer from uh, the bending region. So you're going to see disubstituted um, aromatic. So uh, dimethyl benzene of some kind, you know. Um, ortho, para, meta. Okay. So you're going to see what kind of di different stretches you're going to see lower than a thousand centimeters inverse. Okay. Then the next, so you're going to use uh, the IHD and spectrum to guess a compound. I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, proton NMR to kind of help you out with um, that problem. So, again, 1560 on page 769. Okay. All right. And then... Uh, Let's we'll see, the other one is 15.62. Um, I cannot seem to find that particular example. Hmm. Okay, well, we'll go over it together. So just pause for a few minutes and uh, try to give those examples a um, Okay, so let's go over some examples here. 15.41 on page 765 for A. Uh, you're going to have a dehydration reaction, so you're going from a secondary alcohol to a uh, cis cyclic um, alkene. So going from a 3600 uh, centimeter inverse, which kind of broad OH stretch, to uh, that which disappears and then uh, what appears is a 1650 uh, C, 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 C double bond stretch uh, there in the uh, CC double bond stretch region. Okay, on to B. So 1700 uh, centimeters inverse is where you're going to see uh, just a typical carboxylic acid. This range, do this doesn't fluctuate too much from uh, the 1700 value. Okay, so if we were to treat treat it with uh, diazomethane, it's going to um, basically add a CH3 group over there in place of the uh, of the uh, hydrogen, protic hydrogen, going from 1700 to 1740. Now these are going to be really sharp um, C double bond O stretches that you're going to be uh, seeing, and these are very 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 distinct. Okay. Okay, on to D. We're going from a secondary to a tertiary um, amine. So in other words, you're going to see one sole peak right there at 3,400, or stretch rather. And then you're not going to see anything in that region, so that should be able to tell you that you have, um, you've methylated that and removed the hydrogen in its place. Okay. Um, now for E... You're starting off with some kind of um, epoxide here, or with two methyl groups on each end. Okay, so it's going to be a symmetric molecule. If you treat it in the in the uh, presence of a base, you're just going to pop the ring open, and then you're going to get a diol. Okay, so this is uh, butane two three diol. So going from 1100 centimeters, which is where you'll see that CO single stretch. Okay, so <clears throat> going from there and then to 3,500 centimeters inverse to where that OH is going to be more broad, again, from hydrogen bonding, either inter or intramolecular. 
And then last, uh, going or for uh, example I, so you're just reducing that um, C double bond O to a uh, an alcohol, secondary alcohol, using lithium aluminum hydride, which is a reducing agent or hydride agent. This um, hydrogen is going to be over uh, on the top, so this hydrogen is going to be at the bottom. Okay. So going from 1670, which is going to be, again, a... Um, conjugated uh, ketone to a secondary alcohol going from 1670 this is going to get removed um, you know looking at your product and then you'll see this 3500 broad stretch uh, appear in your product representing the alcohol okay. now predicting uh, the right isomer from bending regions around less than a thousand centimeters inverse problem 15.59 Okay, so uh, you have three spectra to choose from. The uh, single peak that you see at 880 is going to be um, a bending frequency <clears throat> just below 1,000 again. So that's going to show you that there you're going to have a symmetric stretch or, uh, bending right here uh, for an ortho group. Remember, there's an axis of symmetry here, so you're not going to see much of a difference or change in where these um, CH bonds sort of bend in and out of the plane, or maybe wag back and forth. You'll see a little bit of a difference here, even though you do have an axis of symmetry, you do have three different types of CH uh, bonds. Okay, just because of the, uh, you know, these, these uh, carbons tugging away from some electron density over here. Okay, so this is uh, for the ortho isomer. It's going to align with spectrum number two. Spectrum number three is going to align with the meta. And then for the para, just process of elimination, you're going to see that align with spectrum number one. So you're going to have that um, sole bend at 830 inverse centimeters. So notice how for meta you have two. All right, uh, 1560, so again, use IHD to calculate, um, and then the spectrum to guess the compound. So I've added a hint here, so four um, equivalent, or sorry, four proton signals, one at uh, 7.12, or sorry, 7.12 parts per million, uh, integrating to two hydrogens, 6.73 parts per million to one hydrogen, 6.64, parts per million at two hydrogens and then 3.55 um, at two hydrogens so that is going to be c6 h 7 n okay so that's going to be the um, molecular formula so 4 ihd is going to be calculated from that particular um, molecular formula so you have one IHD from the ring itself, okay, and then three from the three double bonds, okay. So in other words, it's going to be an aromatic compound, which this is going to, um, these signals are going to corroborate with, with, with having an aromatic compound. Remember, you're going to have one, two, three distinct hydrogens there about that ring if it's monosubstituted. So it's monosubstituted benzene ring. Uh, now on to the actual IR spectrum. So you're going to have two uh, stretches. Again, they're going to be asymmetric because of the because uh, of the lone pair there. You're going to have something at 3,400 and then 3,300 wave numbers, uh, sort of overlapping with one another. And then at the monosubstituted benzene ring, the bending uh, region, you're going to see something at 700 and 750 for monosubstituted. So notice that's a little bit different than what we saw for the dye substituted from the previous problem. Okay, um, so the last one is use IHD and deduce a structure from a double or triple bond stretches. So C3H2O2, uh, that IHD is going to be equal to 3. Okay, uh, 
again, this is problem 15.62 on page 769. Sorry not for not uh, mentioning that. So you have a broad stretch of 3,000. So that's an overlapping CH of an alkyne stretch. So that means that, um, you know, in the, you're not going to have very much of uh, anything in terms of uh, CH from, you know, an alkene or an alkane species. <coughs> Excuse me. So in other words, this is going to be a terminal alkyne. Okay. And then um, that's also going to show up at 2130 for this CC triple bond stretch. And then 1690 for the carboxylic acid. Remember that even if these show up around uh, 1700, it's slightly conjugated from one of these pi bonds. So in other words, it's going to drop lower in energy. Okay. So in other words, uh, this is the particular compound you're going to get. So you're going to have a carboxylic acid with a terminal alkene uh, directly fused to it. Sorry, alkyne directly fused to it. Okay, so that wraps up um, the IR portion of this um, lecture. Okay, so C13 is going to be rather brief, I promise. So just some <clears throat> key takeaways of C13. I'm not expecting you to be this spectroscopist whiz by the end. But, uh, you know, you still need to kind of uh, look at some data and, and deduce. So, like, it's part of the larger uh, piece of the puzzle here, right? So uh, you can think of this as sort of the border of a puzzle if you're trying to solve, solve for one. All right, so C13, uh, abundance is one out of 100 carbons. So if you were to look at a relative abundance uh, in nature, that's what you're going to find just from any given sample. Excuse me. So this takes more time slash sample to collect C13 data versus one um, proton NMR spectrum of the same sample. Reason being is because, again, it's in such low um, abundance relative to 1H, right? And um, <clears throat> you're just going to have to do scan after scan after scan to make sure that these carbons, some of them are going to be kind of um, dull in terms of intensity. Okay, so you really want to have things be scanned properly outside of the baseline. And so integrations do not correlate with the number of nuclei like hydrogens do. So, you know, when you see those integration readings for um, a proton spectrum, you don't notice the same thing with carbon. Carbon is really more of a count of distinct carbon signals. So these are always going to be singlets. Uh, they're, so you're not going to really have to pay attention to any splitting. But remember that carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. So you're going to see a range that's going to be much more broad. So 25, or sorry, 250 to 14 ppm, uh, least to most shielded. <clears throat> so uh, really the best way to tell uh, what a car primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary carbon is, um, you're really going to use DEP90 and DEP135 as uh, different experiments to deduce what you really have in a particular um, sample. But a regular C13 experiment is going to show all four. What is going to be particularly telling of this regular C13 experiment, experiment is going to be the quaternary carbons that show up. Because they're not going to show up in either of the 90 or depth 135. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, and then, of course, all the other ones also show up in a regular C13 experiment. But... Um, DEP90 and DEP135 tell you exactly what kind of connections you're going to have. So in DEP90, only a CH, um, or in other words, tertiary carbon is going to show. And that signal is going to be facing upward. Okay. Uh, whereas with DEP135 experiments, you're going to see the baseline in the middle, and then you're going to see um, the even-numbered uh, carbons, i.e. CH2, or secondary, they're going to be going downward, okay? 
So when I'm saying even numbered, even numbered hydrogens which are attached to them. So odd number is going to be CH, which is again going to be tertiary. So that means all tertiary carbons are going to show up both in 135 and 190, or sorry, in 90. But CH3, or just the methyl groups, which are primary, are going to show up as well in 135. And they're going to go up. So that's really going to be the smoking gun in terms of your methyl groups where they're going to show up where they are going to show up in 135 and not in a 90. CH2s are only going to show up in depth 135. They're not going to show up in a 90. They are going to show up in a regular C13 experiment. Okay, so why don't you guys uh, pause for a couple minutes and do some practice and um, see what kind of um, signals you would expect in 90 and 135 for each of the following, given the criteria I just mentioned here. So pause for a few minutes. All right, so uh, for this first comp compound on the left, so for uh, DEP90, you're going to have a total of one, two, three. Remember, there's this axis of symmetry uh, going horizontally. So you have a total of three uh, signals going up. Remember, that's going to be tertiary carbons. So in other words, just one hydrogen attached. Okay, and then uh, for 135, you're going to have those same um, signals, so 1, 2, 3. And then this one right here, remember this is going to be a methyl group, so it's also going to be showing going up. So a total of 1, 2, 3, 4 going up. And then just the 1 going down, because this is where the CH, there's a CH2 right there that's terminal. Okay, remember that the quaternary, in other words, the ones that, the carbons that don't have any um, uh, hydrogens attached to, the, to them are going to show up on either experiment. Okay, so <clears throat> for the second experiment, or for the second uh, compound here, remember that these two are identical. Okay, so these are two methyl groups, so they're going to be the same signal. Um, so in other words, that's going to be for... Uh, for 90, it's just going to be this one right here, right? That's going to be a tertiary carbon. And then you're going to have one, two, three for 135. Remember, because you're counting both CH3 and CH. Okay, and then you're just going to have the sole um, signal going down that's going to be CH2 or even. Okay, and again, this isn't going to show up on either because this is quaternary. So no hydrogens attached here. Quaternary doesn't show up on 90 or 135. Okay, last one. Um, so this isn't going to show up. These two are going to show um, literally up on 90. Remember, they're, they're both uh, tertiary. So uh, those are going to be the same that are going to be represented in 135 because we don't see any CH3 groups attached at any point of this molecule. And then we have three going down. Remember, these are all gonna be chemically distinct because they have different um, <clears throat> electronic environments, right? You have an, a CC double bond here and you have a CO double bond here. So these are asymmetric. So all these are gonna be different signals. So uh, for 90, DEP 90, you're gonna have two going up. DEP 135, you're gonna have two going up and three going down. Okay, so uh, revisiting uh, problem 16.58 uh, from the last NMR module, page 831, count the car carbon and hydrogen signals, not the splitting. So I'm not uh, concerned about the splitting for carbon. Remember, there's an uh, axis of symmetry here as well as an axis of symmetry here. So in other words, you're going to have one, two different types of carbons. Don't forget the quaternary carbons now. Remember, we're just talking about a regular C13 experiment. So two for a carbon, hydrogen, one, two. Remember, again, we have an axis of symmetry here. So two of each. Okay, for this next exper or for this next compound, how many carbons are you going to have about the ring? One, two, three, four. Then uh, five, six, 
seven, eight, because these two are going to be the same. So a total of eight carbon signals. Hydrogen, you're going to have one. Again, these are going to be identical. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now for this ester, remember you have two separate environments left and right. We do do have two ethyl groups, but we're not thinking about splitting now. We're thinking about where these are going to show up in terms of PPM or uh, chemical shift because these are radically different electronic environments <clears throat> to the left and the right of the actual ester functionality here. Okay, so uh, we have a total of one, two three, four, five carbons. Okay, and then a total of one, two, three, four hydrogen signals. Okay, and then um, for the third, or sorry, for the fourth compound, we don't have an axis of symmetry here, although we do have one here. So we have a total of one, two, three hydrogen signals. How many carbon signals? One, two, three, four. Okay. So these two are not the same. All right. Now the last one. So remember this chicken foot, <clears throat> one, two, three, these are all going to be the same. So it's just going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. Okay, and then for hydrogen, you're gonna have one, again, integrating to nine, nothing here, two, three, nothing here, four, five, six hydrogens. All right, so these are all count of signals, again. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, Let's see what the depth per, uh, experiments are for 90 and 135. Okay, so we have one going up for uh, 90. Remember, that's going to represent a CH. So for 135, that should be the same. It should just be one going up. Again, because all these carbons are equivalent. Okay, so how about for the second compound? We have a total, uh, this isn't going to show. We're going to have one, two, three going up. Another one right here. So four going up on 90. 135, we're going to have one, Two going down. Okay. And then <clears throat> one, two, three, or well, wait, one, two, three, four, five going up. Okay. For 135. Again, that's counting both for the, the signals that are gonna that are gonna go up are gonna be uh, for CH3 as well as CH. Okay. All right. Now for these, uh, for, for, for this compound, for JEP90, you're going to have <clears throat> uh, none. All right. Because you don't have any CH groups. 135. You're going to have go, you're going to have two going up. And then two going down. Okay. These two are going to go down. These two are going to go up. Again, there's different electronic environments there from left and right. Okay. All right. Uh, for this third example, so we have um, two asymmetric carbons here. These aren't going to show up on either experiment. So in other words, 90 is going to have two up. 135 is going to have 
two up as well and no methyl groups. So there you have it. Okay, and then uh, this final compound, one going up for 135. So one, two, three, four going up. How many going down? One, two. Okay, and then 90. You're just going to have one, two, three going up. <clears throat> okay, so last uh, problem here. Problem 16.63 says options to match. So uh, count the distinct carbons and then see what um, actual spectra you get from 16.63. Uh, this should be on the same page on page 831. So pause for a couple of minutes and see what you come up with. And then we'll wrap things up. All right, so just to wrap things up, it's going to be an axis of symmetry about all these molecules. <clears throat> but just remember that there's, uh, so there's going to be four signals in total that are going to double up. So they're all going to be proportional. Four signals in total. So this is going to be uh, represented by the top left spectrum. And that problem, it's going to be on page 832, by the way. Okay, so then three signals. Again, these are going to quadruple up. Remember, there's going to have an axis of symmetry in between. Then you're going to have two here, two here that are also going to be the same. So a total of three signals. This is going to be the bottom spectrum. Okay, and then last, uh, you're going to have a total of five signals for four methyl heptane. So one, two, three, four. So right there in the middle is where that axis of symmetry is. And that's gonna be the branching uh, location. So it's gonna be a total of five with that methyl group there. So by process elimination, and you can sort of see five, even though two signals kind of overlap on the top right spectrum. All right. That pretty much does it for uh, spectroscopy. Definitely enough to keep you guys busy till uh, the end of the semester. So um, hope you found this uh, information useful. Try some other problems while you can if you have the time and uh, be sure to get ready for the uh, final. All right, have a good one.